from Car Rigs and Ingram, this is It Figures, the CRI podcast, an accounting, advisory, and industry focused podcast for business and organization leaders, entrepreneurs, and anyone who is looking to go beyond the status quo. Hi, this is Chris Hoffman. I am the tax service line leader for Car Rigs and Ingram and also a partner in the Nashville, Tennessee office. In that role, I oversee the tax function of the firm, as well as serving my clients in Nashville, which range from healthcare companies to retailers to high net worth individuals. Today with me, I have Max Smith. Hi, I'm Max Smith. I'm a tax partner in Atlanta with 25 plus years of experience in public accounting, and I am working in the uh, state and local tax area since my time starting with uh, CRI. Thanks, Mac. One of the topics that has come up uh, with some of my clients is the Wayfair case and um, how it's going to impact their business. Um, So before we jump into Wayfair, uh, Mac, can you lay out the landscape uh, of the sales and use tax um, environment before the Wayfair case? Sure. Prior to Wayfair, it was fairly simple. A, a business who did not have a physical presence in a state was not subject to that state to collect being responsible for collecting that state's sales tax on sales on sales of tangible personal property into the state. After Wayfair changed all that. So yeah, it sounds like yeah, as long as clients didn't have maybe a warehouse or a building or anything in a, in a state. They basically could identify where they needed to file those sales tax returns. So, so long as a client didn't have property or employees in a state, they weren't going to be subject to that state's sales tax regime. Okay. Now, how did Wayfair change that? After Wayfair, Wayfair established this economic principle of economic nexus, meaning that a business enterprise could have enough economic activity in a state to establish presence in that state and be subject to that state's sales tax uh, regime. Okay. And um, the Wayfair case, I think that was a South Dakota court case. So is Wayfair only applicable for clients that are selling into South Dakota? Uh, No, don't don't I wish. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, it was a Supreme Court ruling. And so the Supreme Court, in that ruling established at the national level, the rules for making up uh, for for having sales tax be applicable into uh in the various states you know the most important thing in that is it's wayfair is an online entity uh, but it's not just for online sales wayfair is applicable to anybody who's selling tangible property into the various states okay and do you see many other states um following a similar approach to wayfair or following the wayfair decision uh, absolutely. Uh, as of currently, all but three states have adopted economic nexus standards, subjecting anybody who's selling tangible personal property into their state is going to be subject, to, uh, beyond certain thresholds, is going to be subject to their sales tax regime. And what are some of those economic standards um, that you've mentioned? What are states adopting there? So the Supreme Court set out a rule that basically said if you had $100,000 of sales or 200 or more transactions in a state, regardless of size, that would basically, if you meet those criteria, you're going to be subject to that state's sales tax. Yeah. And do you, do you think that many businesses are set up to track sales into a state or a number of transactions into a state? My experience thus far is... While there are some that do a very good jo- job of keeping track of that stuff, um, there's a great many that don't have or haven't put the resources into to tracking that information. Yeah, that's what I've encountered as well. Um, I, I find a lot of clients that had that maybe the the warehouse in a state or a building in a state and could make sales to the other states and never really worried or tracked where those sales were going because they knew they weren't in their state. So they just um, didn't even track it or worry about tracking those transactions. 
now post Wayfair, um, they found that they are ill-equipped to try and now start tracking uh, sales by state or transactions by state. Um, so it's going to create a new new process or a new technology or a new tool they're going to have to implement to start um, start doing that. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's more critical now more than ever to to be able to track that information because uh, certainly the states are trying to monitor that. As closely as they can, they're getting their their uh, ducks in a row. They've all passed some sort of economic nexus standard, and now they're looking to apply it because they're losing out in their minds on a great deal of uh, great deal of revenue. So, what would you recommend that businesses do now um, as they contemplate their reaction to Wayfair? I believe businesses need to, as quickly as possible, implement a system where they're tracking the destination of their of their sales. If they're selling tangible personal property into states other than their, their home state, they need to make sure that they're tracking where all the destinations are and the volume of those transactions into the various states. Okay. And um, moving past sales tax, I've had some clients ask uh, whether the Wayfair will impact their income tax filings. What do you think is going to happen in that, in that world of income taxes? I think Wayfair gives you an, I, currently, it doesn't have an impact or it shouldn't have an impact on income tax. Public law 86272 establishes that for income tax purposes, you have to have a physical presence in the state. What, how that physical presence manifests itself can be different depending on the state. Sometimes just simply registering in a state for income tax purposes is enough to create nexus for income tax purposes in that state. But most states, for, for most businesses selling into those states, um, again, tangible personal property into the states, with, you know, it, they're going to have to have a physical presence in that state. So whether it's employees other than sales people and, or property in the state, you know, sometimes people will keep inventory in the state. Even if they don't own the warehouse, they'll leave that that's enough to create nexus for income tax purposes. Um, you've got a physical presence in that state. But, you know, so currently you have to have a physical presence. I would think that the Wayfair case gives us an outline of what the Supreme Court thinks is the direction of things and is willing to sit there and barring congressional action is willing to adopt a more state friendly application of that. And so I would imagine that when physical presence is litigated in front of the Supreme Court, surprising that that it adopts an economic uh, nexus standard uh, for income tax as well as for, uh, in addition to the sales tax, economic nexus that is established. Yeah. So it sounds like it's stay tuned. Right now, Wayfair doesn't impact income taxes, but stay tuned for maybe a congressional change or Supreme Court change. Because I think you bring up a good point that um, the Wayfair decision actually overturned an earlier uh, Supreme Court decision and Quill decision that had been passed saying that states couldn't charge sales tax without without that uh, physical presence in a state. So Wayfair really overturned an earlier Supreme Court case. So likewise, um, they could very well um, overturn a, a longstanding law in eighty six two seventy two. Yes, in, in fact, in the in the Quill decision that Chris is talking about, the Supreme Court was basically in their decision was asking Congress to sit there and do something to address the issue. They weren't willing to address it at that time, but they basically said, barring, you know, Congress needs to address it. Well, Congress spent many years, uh, decades, uh, not addressing the issue. So the Supreme Court felt it was necessary for them to step in, and that's why they were willing to overturn their own decision from, from many years ago. And, and I, I, I would think they would apply that same reasoning to any future decisions on an income tax basis. And can you list some of the uh, sales tax um, services that you've performed for some of your clients? Sure. Um, in the, occasionally, we'll do compliance as far as preparation of sales tax returns. But more recently, it's done a lot of uh, voluntary disclosure agreements, have clients who are want to become compliant with the regulations and Many, many states offer opportunities to sit there and say, we'll, we'll 
forego penalties or interest or will substantially reduce them if you're willing to come forward voluntarily and, and you know become compliant with their laws. So doing several of those currently, uh, Wayfair has triggered a, a great deal of interest in, in doing that because it touches so many more people, more businesses than it ever has before. Um, that's probably the biggest thing right now we're doing. Do a lot of nexus studies, just say, hey, are, is it applicable? You know, in my situation, so going through a client's various details of what their transactions look like and determining whether these rules apply in a, in a sales tax and, and in income tax situations. Okay. I think then another maybe item to mention on those uh, voluntary disclosure agreements, those VDAs, is you can sometimes get a, a statute of limitations uh, where you only have to go back maybe X number of years, um, you know, depends on which state, but uh, you may only have to go back and pay three to four years worth of worth their back taxes and the state will forgive everything else. Yeah, the states are very, I mean, because they're, they're looking for revenue, they're very understanding and I believe most of them have some sort of voluntary disclosure agreement program, but and that can be very beneficial. Business owner gets compliant and the states get revenue and everybody's happy. And as long as you promise to go forward and continue to be compliant, it's all good. It's it, it, Particularly in sales tax, it's one of those areas where once you start filing in a state, you always have a filing obligation forever and ever, even if you don't have any sales in that state mm -hmm. uh, anymore. Out sort of a, outside of officially removing yourself from the state and going through the process of disengaging from that state officially, you always have an obligation, whereas part of the process is, is keeping that up to date. Right. Uh, yeah, another service that I've uh, I've done for clients uh, contemplating uh, getting compliant with sales tax would be a taxability matrix, where they'll send us a list of the inventory that they sell, and we'll go through um, and the jurisdictions they they sell it into and make determinations of um, whether that that inventory is taxable or non taxable. Uh, it's just a maybe a little twist on the the nexus studies that you um, you mentioned is. If you're going to start filing in a state, you know, once you start filing there, what you're selling taxable or non-taxable, um, because there's some, some products that may be non-taxable in, in certain states, but taxable in other states. Yeah, you can't generally, what I found, I've done similar things is we're finding that every state is different. Every state rules and regulations are different. Um, you can't apply what would happen in your home state and assume that that's the same applicability uh, in another state. Frequently, um, states have special regulations related to like manufacturers. Well, manufacturers are designing goods to resell. If I'm selling to a manufacturer, shouldn't I be exempt from that sales tax or shouldn't that be an exempt sell? Well, that's not always the case. Uh, there's a great many states and if you're selling to a manufacturer, that's the thing that you're selling has to be included in that manufacturer's final product. In order to be for it to be an exempt state, but it, or exempt sale, but it, it's just it's a state by state rule that you just need to be aware of, and we can certainly help you determine that. Thanks, Mac, and I want to thank everyone for listening to today's podcast. Um, I do encourage you if you have any questions, visit our website at cricpa.com. Uh, we have uh, lots of professionals that can help you if you're. Um, wondering where your nexus um, is, where it lies, or whether your products are taxable or non-taxable, or just want to um, get an analysis of how Wayfair may affect your business. Your CRI professional can help you answer any of those questions and much more. If you want more CRI insights or are interested in learning about our firm, please visit our website at CRICPA.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of It Figures, the CRI podcast. You can subscribe to It Figures on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you prefer to listen to your podcasts. If you liked what you heard today, please leave us a review.